It's good to be back again this evening and pray that we can have some encouraging uh, moments here in the scriptures as we seek to arm ourselves against our enemy. Uh, had an uh, opportunity to think about uh, some of the ways that uh, Satan does seek to devour us. Uh, so I was thinking about that for the article on the bulletin and uh, had me thinking quite a bit of the fact that he is always, always seeking to trip us up. And it's interesting when we look into the scriptures and really look at his devices, at his game plan, his tactics. He relies so heavily on lies and deception. In other words, we don't often even realize uh, when we're slipping. Uh, what he does is he manipulates what we assume is to be true or what we maybe uh, uh, understand to be reasonable or rational. And by our own misleading, if we aren't watching our minds and having our minds guarded against um, his deceptions, we can follow things that he misleads us and coerces us uh, to seek and thinking it's for our best interest or thinking that it's for uh, our, our ultimate good when he has deceived and been successful at misleading and misdirecting us. In fact, if you turn to John chapter chapter 8, uh, as we spent a good bit of time looking at uh, the Gospel of John this morning, we're going to look at several passages in the Gospel of John tonight, uh, particularly with what Jesus flat out says about the devil. He comes out and exposes him and warns us why it is so important that we do feed on the bread of life lie that we talked about this morning because it is the essence of truth it is the essence of understanding what is spiritually reliable and dependable and in that pursuit of truth it exposes the lies of satan our adversary in john chapter 8 verse 42 uh, jesus says this he said if god were your father you would love me for i proceeded forth and have come from god for i have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God. <clears throat> Some bold accusations from Jesus to flat out tell his enemies, well, if it's easy. The, the reason why you're rejecting me is because you're following the devil. They did not seek to, to, to follow the devil. That's why they were, they were so repulsed by that statement. They did not actually seek to follow the devil. In their minds, they were rejecting the devil. They were deceived. That's his point. Says, you have been deceived and you don't recognize he's lied to you and you've taken it hook, line, and sinker and don't even realize the things you think are true are really false. That's how good he is. These were zealous individuals who dedicated their lives to serving God. And he says that all that you base your truth on is a lie. And he has successfully lied to you and deceived you. And so we want to be uh, weary of that. Do not underestimate the devil. Do not underestimate him as our adversary. Even when we arm ourselves with the scripture, we must always be sharpening our understanding, sharpening the depth of it, as we, again, we t mentioned this morning, how we need to continue to feed off of it. Because that's what guards us against falling into the lies and the deceptions. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, again, uh, G uh, the word of God exposes how the devil succeeds in leading people to hell. Uh, that's the end result. That's how horrible his deception is. Is not only is it misguiding us to not find the abundant life in Jesus now, but ultimately we will be deceived when we find our eternal destiny is punishment and severe, horrible suffering for all of eternity. 
and says the reason why so many people will wind up in hell, sadly, is because they were deceived. No one just seeks to say, yeah, that's where I want to go. Many people seeking to avoid hell will actually be in hell. Think about that. We, in other words, we must always make sure that our minds are clear and we are surrendering and submitting to the direction God has for us in His Word and we trust Him and not ourselves and not our, our own understanding. As so many Proverbs warn us about that. But Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, flat out says, the devil who deceived them uh, brought them into that, that horrible place. So we just want to look at, I just want to look at just very quickly here this evening, three areas where the devil has been very good at deceiving others and where we must be always on the defense, always um, examining ourselves and guarding against his misleading deceptions. One of the, the first ones we'll look at is one of the uh, earliest ones we see in Scripture is the devil is very good at convincing people to believe that since God often says no, he can't possibly be good. Many people reject the goodness of God simply because that there are many places in the Scripture where the Lord would tell us, don't do that. Or, I know you want to do that. I know you think that would be good for you. But I'm telling you, you are not permitted to go there. And it gives us severe consequences if we disobey Him. Many people immediately have bought in the lie, and the devil is very good at deceiving people, at believing that if God were truly good, he would just let us do whatever we wanted. He would give you the, all the desires of your heart. That ultimately, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to have everything your heart desires, and he will gladly provide those things so long as you just uh, uh, ultimately recognize him as the ultimate being in your life. And ultimately, all the things that you simply want, he wants that for you, and he'll provide a way uh, to give it to you. We recognize that that simply is not true. God oftentimes tells us, don't go there. Don't do this. Don't think that. Don't say that. Don't believe that. Don't worship me this way. Don't believe this. Uh, don't follow that. And the devil is very good that it, we, we, we look and we focus so much on all these negative attributes where God is warning us, God is uh, condemning uh, uh, certain individuals who do not heed his warning that God could not possibly be good, especially since there is such an, uh, a drastic eternal consequence such as hell. But let's turn over to Genesis chapter 3 where we see the origin of this lie. This lie begins all the way back in the garden. <laughs> that Satan began getting Eve to contemplate the fact that God did not allow them to eat of every tree in the garden and gets them to, to question the goodness of God. In Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And I would say certainly he is crafty since chapters 1 and 2 are dominated by one word, good. God saw that this was good. All the things that God is creating, we see, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and until the very end, it was very good. And the very things that God has been dishing out and orchestrating and designing all good, and Satan gets Eve to question, is God really all good? Because I think there's one thing he said you can't have. In all the vast things that God is permissive, there is something that he is restrictive. And therefore, I want you to really question whether or not you can trust that God wants you to be uh, the ultimate goodness in your life. And he was successful at that. Eve actually begins to doubt and is misled and questions. If this looks so good, if this is so desirable, and it would bring so much goodness to me if I partook of it, how could it possibly be bad? And doesn't that say something about God? Doesn't that say that, that I can't really truly trust God's direction, that I may have to take control of my life and my direction. I may have to put God aside at certain moments because I can't trust him. That's what the devil succeeded in getting Eve to do, to make her own choices independent of God's instruction and God's leading. Notice what he says. He says, uh, this is how crafty he was. Notice how he finishes out that verse. He said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat 
from any tree of the garden. Satan is so sly. He begins with this ultimate negative. Well, well, certainly we could, admit, we could admit God would not be good if he said you can't have anything, right? So what would be the all, uh, obvious logical opposite? Well, God would not be good if he said you can't have anything. So God only can be good unless he says you can have everything. And that's not what God said. Notice how he begins this doubt? The first line of the premise is if God said you can't have anything, he would not be good. I think that's a fair assumption. <laughs> so would it be fair then to the, say the opposite is true? If God says you can have everything, that's how we know he's good. He didn't say that though, did he? And Eve corrects him and says, well, no, you're, you're wrong. No, God didn't say we can't have anything. He did say we can have any tree of the garden except for one. And this is where Satan gets her to question, can you really trust that God is good then? After all, if he was good, he would be permissive of everything. Why would he say no? Why would he be so restrictive? And he puts thoughts in her mind as to why this could possibly be. In verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, except the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden. God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And notice the serpent jumps on this opportunity and twists her thinking to question, is God really good? And it begins to get her to think, I doubt it. He's withholding things because he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to experience the ultimate good. And he's purposefully keeping you from it. In verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And notice verse 6, the lie takes root, and Eve starts believing it. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. What does she decide? She says, I, I believe that the serpent must be right. I believe the Satan, I believe the serpent over, I believe what God has said. God has said all these other trees are good, and he's convinced me that God can't be all that good, otherwise he would let me have, this was obviously has the appearance of good right in front of my very eyes. Is God's restriction bad? It's an age-old question. How could God possibly be good? He says, but you can't have that. You know what's interesting about this is we find there was another tree that was exceptionally good. And they took their eyes off of it. Because there is this other tree that apparently God was permitting them to eat of it, they just never had. And once they ate from the tree that they were restricted from, God sees that they're not fit to eat from the other tree. And we find that God was restrictive because he wanted to make sure that they recognized the ultimate good of what was permissive. Yes, the goodness of God is represented in his permissiveness, but when he says no, we can trust that God is exceptionally good because he has the ultimate knowledge and the ultimate understanding of what truly is good for us and we cannot trust our eyes. We cannot always trust what is immediately in front of us. It is foolish for us to direct our own steps as the Proverbs warn us that the ends thereof are the ways of death. God's ways are higher than our ways. God sees farther than we can see. And God has understanding far beyond us. That's what makes him God. And that's what makes us us with our limitations. And yet in our limitations, we begin to think, well, I'm in the proper position because of what I think is good. I can therefore make this decision. And I can conclude, God must not be good. Otherwise, he'd let me have it. It's interesting that, notice in verse 22, we find that all along, there was another tree that was perfectly good to eat from. In verse 22. Genesis 3.22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might stretch out his hand 
and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. They were able to eat from that tree. Isn't that amazing? It was there all along. All along this ultimate tree of ultimate good. And Satan deceived them at thinking, when God says no, that's a question about his goodness. When really, it was God looking out for them to make sure that they went for the proper permissive area and that they restrained themselves from that which they could not see all of the consequences. They could not possibly see all of the horror and the death and the suffering. They didn't understand it. And that's what God was protecting them from. God's restrictions are, yes, good because he's keeping us from harming ourselves. But Satan is good at twisting that. Then you can't have that. Well, how can I trust he's good? Turn to John chapter 10. Turn to John chapter 10. Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. God ultimately is shepherding us to make sure we always choose that which is beneficial for us. And there are going to be times when God will say no as a good shepherd would. A good shepherd will tell us where the danger is. A good shepherd will say, no, watch out. If you go over that edge, you're going to fall over the cliff or you're going to have this disease that's going to snatch you and it's going to, 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 to uh, harm you and have all kinds of consequences that will uh, uh, continue to affect you and others around you. Jesus is that good shepherd and we can trust his goodness. And he says he looks out for us because there's an enemy, a deceiver, who wants to harm us. He wants to kill us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to take away all of the good consequences we could have if we follow God. That's the way Jesus describes it in John 10. That's the truth. John chapter 10, verse 7. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's what he did in the garden. How did he steal? How did he kill? How did he destroy? He tempted Eve to question God's goodness because of his restriction. When ultimately we find out, oops, God's restriction was to point towards his ultimate goodness. There's another tree you can eat from. Well, they were disqualified from eating from that once they were in that condition. And they couldn't. It was there all along. Notice what he says in verse 11. Of John chapter 10, verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. How can I trust the ultimate goodness of God? Even because of the bad decisions we've made all the way back to Adam and Eve, Jesus came to not only correct that, to restore all of God's goodness back to us, but then to retrain our thinking and to teach us to trust God at all times, even his restrictions, to trust that it's like a shepherd. That's how we must look at God. God is a good shepherd, and Jesus is that shepherd who not only leads us in the paths of righteousness, but he warns us and says, that's a dangerous area, and if you go there, you're going to slip, you're going to fall, and you're going to get hurt. His no is for his goodness. Always. His no's and restrictions are never to harm us. However, the devil deceives us and lies to us about that. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, a great passage where others begin to trust this, that when God says no, this is not a time to question God's goodness, but to trust that he sees something I don't yet fully appreciate because its uh, consequences are so out, 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 outstretched, I cannot comprehend it all, but I need to trust it's there. And ultimately... I need to realize that Satan is wanting to deceive me. And when he deceives me, whatever ultimate good I experience immediately, its consequences always corrupt, always destroy, and always rob us of the ultimate good we could have had if we were to listen to God. 
if we would have listened and trusted that God's no is actually for our own good, we would find that he was protecting us from horrible consequences which far outweigh whatever immediate gratification Satan was alluring and leading us to experience. This is what Moses learned in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24 says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy, here's the key, the passing pleasures of sin. Yeah, that fruit was good to eat for a few seconds until guilt set in. <laughs> yeah, that fruit sure was good to experience, wasn't it? Until immediately that sense of shame and loss and separation from God hit. God said no to protect. And Moses is a great example of one who said no to immediate gratification, choosing rather to trust God says no because he has ultimate goodness that far outweighs whatever potential uh, 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 gratification or, 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 or pleasure that's not going to last. God warns us to trust him because the devil deceives us to choose immediate pleasure and to throw away hope in that which is outlasting, that lasts forever. Ultimate God's goodness. And that's where Moses is a great example for us. Rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, he considered the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. God is good, always. And especially when he says no, it is always for our good. Real quick passage, we'll move on in Hebrews chapter 12. A quick passage, uh, kind of a, uh, utilizing a history lesson from Jacob and Esau of how when we throw away, throw away future blessings, for what Satan says is immediate ratification. We may just have had a lie placed right in front of us. And the devil has misled us. And here in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15. He says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God or the goodness of God. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. Why might we be bitter? Because as God teaches us his goodness, a lot of times it means waiting and trusting in a future reward where it means saying no to things that will interrupt or rob us of that reward and say no to immediate enjoyment. And yet he says, don't get bitter about that. Don't mistrust and start blaming God and saying, well, God, if God was good, he'd let me have this. Well, don't be like Esau, he says. You're being tempted to be like Esau. Don't do it, he says. And by it, many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. He was deceived. He was misled by what was dangling right in front of him and turned away something far greater. The good shepherd says, God says no. Because he sees down the road what we cannot truly appreciate right at this moment and need to trust his goodness. Another area where the devil is good at misleading us, he, te he teaches us that living a life deprived of immediate gratification is ultimately a life of slavery. You cannot possibly be happy. You cannot possibly have any enjoyment living a life where you have to actually have to say no to things that you could gratify yourself immediately with. Yet the opposite is true when we read Titus chapter 3 and verse 3. And Titus chapter 3 verse 3 says, rather the word of God teaches us the opposite. And what he tells us is many people that believe the lie, just, just choose things that just give you immediate enjoyment, immediate gratification, immediate satisfaction right now. You know what they end up finding? They found that that was a life of slavery. Because it built up kind of a palate or a taste in, 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 in their enjoyment and their satisfaction. They had to keep replaying it or re-experiencing it, going to it back again and again and again. Why? Because its enjoyment is often short-lived. 
It has an expiration date on it. And the devil doesn't tell us about that. He doesn't tell us that all of a sudden whatever good is going to wear off rather quickly. He doesn't tell us that all that enjoyment is going to flutter away. And then we're left with saying, well, what do I do now? Do I stop or do I go and do it again? And I can easily get trapped where I am so deceived that I cannot stop going back to that, which again, is, I even recognize as harmful. But I'm programming my mind to say, only thing I know that drew me, gives me any sense of joy is what I just to choose immediate gratification at the moment. Titus chapter 3 warns us about that, and the truth came out that they said, we were, we were deceived. They said, we were lied to. Satan uh, put it before us, and we believed the lie, and we were disobedient. Titus chapter 3, verse 3, he says, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived. Yes, deceived by the lie that just do whatever feels good, whatever makes you uh, uh, enjoy, just give you any kind of pleasure right now. Well, they did that. Notice what happened. They became enslaved. It wasn't freedom. It was slavery to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. You can always have bigger, better, and lasting a little bit longer when other people have it and you don't, you can't be satisfied. I need to get more of what they have. Their, their version is a little bit better than what I've got. It was, they were miserable. <laughs> Verse 4, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. The truth set us free. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 8. John chapter 8 says the truth of God, that having a, a, a sense of, of discipline, that is the trust that ultimately God's goodness, and don't just immediately just reach out for what's immediately in front of you, just as Eve did, and as Esau did, and as so many times we're tempted to do the exact same thing, realize we are being led astray. But Jesus tells us his truth that developing self-control in exchange for hope and peace and love in following him and his word is true freedom. He says it sets us free from the lie that we, an immediate gratification is a life of freedom. It's not. It's a deception. And Jesus says the truth frees us from that. John chapter 8 verse 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What sense does it make us free? We turn to John chapter, back up to John chapter 8, verse 28. John 8, verse 28. Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. In other words, Jesus lived a life and he showed us how to do this. Jesus, I just don't choose immediately the first thing that just might be my option and my best pick. I rather let the Lord tell me what to do. I, I trust the direction of my Father. You know what th that led him to? It didn't lead to immediate gratification. All it led to suffering. It actually led to him going to a cross because he was choosing all of his life. I will trust the goodness of God over what might be immediately right in front of me and my options. He said, I don't follow my own initiative. I don't just choose whatever uh, might uh, be immediately enjoyable to me. I don't live that way. I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Well, where did that lead you? Go, go, go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Well, why, why is he choosing this? Why is he trusting in God's goodness when it ultimately sometimes means I suffer and I don't always have immediate pleasure uh, right off the bat? Well, John chapter 3, read verse 31. He said, He who comes from above is above all. And he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, 
of that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. What is ultimately true and what is ultimately good about, love, about, about God? You know what Jesus says? It's his love. There is nothing more true or satisfying or enjoyable than God's love. Nothing. That's why Jesus was always saying, I want to do what pleases the Father. Because when I experience his love, that is the love of God that outweighs any, anything on this earth. Notice what he said, I'm from heaven, not from the earth. And I have a heavenly pursuit. And there's a heavenly satisfaction. What is that heavenly satisfaction? He said, it's the love of my Father. And it is so satisfying. It is so enjoyable. And he later can tell, he says, he wants us to experience that. But that's what he says here. Notice what he says in verse, in verse uh, 33. He says, he who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. Here's the truth. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. In other words, there's nothing tangible. There's nothing that God's love can far outweigh or outdo. In other words, there's nothing that can compete with God's love. No wonder when Jesus was hungry for 40 days, hadn't had anything to eat, and the devil's tempting him, just turn these stones into bread. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from my Father, because that brings me to his love, and that far outweighs any food I could taste. It is the love of God that sustains us. And the devil, understanding that, rejecting it, spitting on it, doesn't want anybody else to have it. He certainly doesn't want us to have it. And so he will lie to us and tell us the lie. Now when God says no, when God says wait, that's not for your enjoyment. No, it is. Because he wants us to ultimately trust in his love which is far outweighing than anything else. Notice what he says in verse uh, 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If the love of God is the greatest thing in the world, I would hate to understand and experience the wrath of God for all of eternity. That's where the devil deceives you. That's where he deceives me. That's where he gets me to, to make those improper, unwise choices. Real quickly, a couple of more verses and we'll move on, but turn to Romans. Romans chapter 5, which really essentially tells us what is the benefit of depriving ourselves and even in mo and sometimes accepting the suffering that comes with saying no, whether it's to immediate gratification, to temptation, or the, the way that we live spiritually in obedience to God. Why is that life better than just choosing the life that gives you immediate uh, satisfaction uh, based on your, the choices you can make. We'll turn to Romans 5. Just read the first five verses. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. That's the key. It's not worth giving up peace. There is no peace with making the choices of immediate uh, pursuit of what the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life tempt us to choose. When we follow that, we're exchanging peace. We're sacrificing peace. It says, but the gospel has taught us that when we have the peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ, now we're able to, yes, have self-control and even willing to suffer. Notice verse 2 through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God because we want to have it for eternity, not just glimpses of it now. In verse 3, he says, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proving character. It helps us say no to temptation. It teaches us and trains us to have the discipline to trust the truth of God and not fall into the lies Satan places. It makes it easier and easier to say no. And notice verse 4. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. 
Why do we live this way? Why do we live in pursuit of, a, of hoping for some future satisfaction? Why do we do that? Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. But when we just have a taste of it, it's leading us to, by faith and hope, trust, wouldn't you want to have that for eternity? The love of God, which equates to the peace of God, it's far more lasting and eternal and satisfying than immediate self-gratification. Satan lies to us and tells us to exchange it. And so we need to let God's word instruct us and teach us. One final other passage. Turn to Galatians chapter 5 and we'll move on to one final point. Galatians chapter 5. I love this. Here, Paul reminds us that when we taste the love of God, when we live for the love of God, that's when we truly have freedom. That's freedom. Notice what he says in Galatians 5, verse 13. You were called to freedom. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What's the benefit of living this way, of living for the love of others, for the love of God, de denying self, crucifying the passions, crucifying the passion for immediate gratification. That's what he says in my, I'm crucifying my flesh to. Stop giving in. Stop thinking that that's, that's where true fulfillment is. Well, what's, what do I get when I follow that? Well, notice the first three descriptions of the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace. And the devil tempts us to let our passions lead us. We sacrifice these three things. We, it goes right out the window. Love, joy, peace. It's not there. It's in truly humbling ourselves and trusting in the love of God, which Jesus demonstrated is in following him always. Even if it means take up your cross, deny yourself, and die for the sake of others. That's where love, peace, and joy are found. And the final point leading us, uh, one, po one, one point to make, that to find joy, you must pursue the things that make you happy. Another lie that kind of sums up all the things, that, the points we've already looked at, a little bit of overlapping, but that really what the, is what this all leads to, is he tempts us to believe that this joy that's talked about in the scriptures ultimately means you make choices that make you immediately happy and, 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 and choices that you are free to make for yourself. Yet, the scripture says it's the opposite. That is true. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 and notice how he tells us actually it's giving up our own personal desires and pursuing what makes others enjoyable or comfortable or happy serving their other needs is actually what brings us joy in philippians chapter 2 notice how paul brings that statement verse 2 make my joy complete or I, I would love to see you all experiencing what i've understood in christ he says let's all be in the same mind in other words he's in other words what, what paul is saying is paul is saying i've discovered this the secret to true joy is in sacrificial service for others so I want you to do this. You need to follow this. Maintaining the same love. United in spirit. Intent on one purpose. What is the purpose? Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. And do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Paul is saying, in other words, that's the secret to this joy that he found in Christ. In fact, that's what Jesus says in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. A few more passages, more to close here and end our lesson. But John chapter 17, notice what he says in verse 13. Jesus says, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. What's this joy he speaks of? 
was is first of all to make sure I have this joy I have to guard myself against the lies of the devil and I guard myself by following the truth of what scripture has already been leading us notice what he says in verse 14 I have given them your word for what purpose because the, the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one who's a liar, who's a deceiver, who will deceive us about all these things we've talked about. So what does he say? He says in verse 16, uh, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Well, what is this truth? What is the, the truth that where joy comes from? Well, he sums it up here in verse 22. Read verse 22. He says, The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be protected, perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them. Even as you have loved me, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Just as Paul was saying, true joy is found in sacrificial love. This is the love Jesus is saying, because this is right before he goes to the cross. And he's saying, I want them to recognize it. I hope it makes a picture in their mind to show that my joy is ultimately me giving up my life. That's my joy. My joy is serving the needs of those who need me to do that. And he's sacrificing his own personal interest for the sake of others and saying, this is what gives me joy. And I want them so badly to guard themselves against the lies of Satan who says it's the opposite. Choose the things that make you immediately happy and you're going to have joy. No, you're going to be robbed of it. You're going to be robbed of it. In fact, one, one final passage. This is what Jesus said about joy, where his joy came from. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Well, how do we sin? We're deceived. That's why we sin, because we're lied to when we believe the lies. So he says, don't believe the lies. Okay, well, what's the truth? Well, here's the truth that Jesus shows us. In verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He found eternal lasting joy in doing this because it was satisfying the love of the Father that is not of this world. He says it's out of this world. It's, it's from heaven. It's, it's from a source that we need to have faith and trust that it lifts us, it sustains us, and it gives us that abounding and abundant life that he wants for us. And so we're, Hopefully, uh, prayerfully, we can be an encouragement to each other. As we uh, mentioned uh, in one of the points in the article, the idea that we need to be pray praying for each other. And we can pray for each other that uh, we will make sure that we'll stand firm against these lies and these deceptions and encourage each other to follow the truth of Scripture. If anyone's with us has never obeyed the gospel, we pray that you will rise above the lie that saving your life now will lead to your ultimate joy in the future. Jesus says, what would it profit you if you gained the whole world only to lose your soul? He says, trust the truth that giving your life up, giving, giving up your attachment to all the allurements of this present world, that that's where you find true life and you can be reborn again and be forgiven of all your sins and have a abundant life and hope in Jesus when you rise up out of the waters of baptism. If you've done that and have gone back into the sin, have been deceived again, God's truth tells us that you can be redeemed, you can be forgiven, you can come back to him, you can repent, make things right. If you need help doing that, we encourage you to come and we'll assist you whatever your need is while we stand and sing this song of encouragement together.